Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Albert Borla, CEO of Pfizer. Albert, nice to see you. Very nice to see you, Andy. Thank you for having me. So let's start off with your recent acquisition, CGen, and I know that you've gotten regulatory approval for that. This is a key driver, you say, for your business going forward. Talk to us about that. Yes, yeah, CGen offers a tremendous opportunity for the cancer patients, and they have a tremendous technology, ADC, and they are a very, very good company, particularly since we announced the acquisition. They have presented data that they are standing. They got standing ovation from scientists when they presented those data. And season in the case of Pfizer, together, one plus one, uh, I think, equals three. We should be able to provide resources that they didn't have before. So we should be able to do things that they wouldn't be able to do before alone. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do it before alone. Right. And, and, and operationally, how much do you see this contributing to, say, the P&L going forward? Oh, it's going to be a tremendous opportunity for growth for us. The season acquisition, right now, we forecasted that will exceed $10 billion by year 2030 in terms of revenues. And right now, we have, they are around less than three in year 2023. So I think growing all these years by, by that much offers significant opportunities for growth. Right. At the recent JP Morgan conference, you talked about this being a year for execution for Pfizer and talked about uh, paying down debt, uh, maybe a stock buyback, maybe no more big M&A. Can you speak to that? Yes, it is. Uh, Pfizer invested significant amounts in M&A and we did that because uh, we have a lot of products that are losing patent between 25 and 30. And we wanted to enhance the portfolio that is coming from our own pipeline by acquisition. So now it is time for us to make sure that we consolidate what we got inside, and make sure that we focus on execution. We not only acquire four companies, season being the most important of them, but also we launched 18 new products in the last 18 months. It is extremely important to get those launches right. You never have a second chance to make the first impression. So it's extremely important right now for us to make sure that execution is the king. Yeah, I want to ask you about the patent cliff. And there's obviously been a lot of talk about that with regard to Pfizer. Um, expecting to lose $17 billion in annual revenue with expirations uh, between 2025 and 2030. And that's off of a $52 billion revenue base in 2025. So exactly how are you planning to, that's excluding COVID uh, medicines and, and the vaccine. So how do you plan to make that up? Look, we just uh, completed, as I said, four acquisitions. The collective right. revenues of those acquisitions, according to our estimations, is 20 billion. So those should offset, uh, more than offset the $17 billion that we are losing. And we just launched 18 new products. And uh, the collective estimation for those products, we have uh, given estimations around 20 billion. The street is lower on that, it's around 13. And I believe that we will see well those products will trend. But even at the street lower expectation, those that will provide a significant growth on top of uh, offsetting the LOEs with the, with the acquisitions. And of course, we are having all the new pipeline, pipeline that will come from now all the way to 2030 and will bring new products. Right. You know, frankly, Albert, uh, the stock was down significantly last year, 43%. No one knows that better than you do, I'm sure. And the stock has been down since you became CEO in 2019 still. And this was through this major wave of acquisitions, through the benefit you had from COVID. Um, are you planning to stay as CEO of this company? Are you the right person to be leading this company going forward? This is something that the board decides. But from my perspective, yes, I plan to stay and uh, I plan to turn around this uh, situation. 2023 was a very disappointing year for us because uh, our stock went down. It went down because we missed our internal projections and our external projections. And uh, it took us down from a position of uh, strength. It's not that we were mediocre and we went down. We used to be the stars of the industry for the last few years. And suddenly we performed very bad. And we are not used to it. Uh, in, I am a five-year CEO. I have 19 earning releases under my belt. 17 of the 19 releases, we beat Bloomberg estimates for EPS. 17 of 19. 13 of the 19, we also beat revenues estimates. So, Right now, we had a very bad year, and we try now to make sure that as we are entering into this new year, we, are, we did all the things that had to be done, some difficult decisions, so that we can turn around.
Do you feel like you have a credibility issue with Wall Street? I know you have an execution, a plan that you plan to execute on, I should say. Um, but just in terms of winning back trust on Wall Street, is that important to you? Look, trust is something that uh, you earn in, uh, in drops and you may lose it in, in buckets. Uh, I don't feel that I have a credibility issue right now, but uh, it's not if I have uh, what I feel or what I think. It is about delivering. And uh, what we need to do it is to execute and deliver. I want to ask you about GLP-1s, weight loss drugs. Um, you guys promised a drug that was going to be a game changer. It didn't pan out. Um, in the same way that that has for Lily, for instance. What went wrong? Oh, it's happening. That's the, the, uh, the nature of, of the beast. When you are in research, uh, there are way more disappointments than uh, successes, unfortunately. Uh, in uh, our uh, first molecule that we was uh, way ahead, uh, we had some uh, liver enzymes that were elevated, so we had to terminate uh, the project. And uh, the second one, we are still uh, ongoing with uh, studies to try to create a once a day release. Obesity is an area that um, it is quite important. And uh, obesity is an area that uh, Pfizer has the right to play because has the capabilities that uh, can allow us to be winners in that space. So we will continue uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, successes will come. Do you have a timeline uh, when it comes to that drug or those drugs? You know, it's going to be different timelines based on the assets. Right now, we have three assets in the clinic. One is Danuglopren, the other is a GLP-1 follow-on molecule, and then there is a third one already in humans, but we haven't disclosed the mechanism of action. And all of that are progressing. Of course, in preclinical, we have many more that, that will come. You made uh, Pfizer a pure play uh, a biopharma company, as others did. Was that a mistake, though, Albert, because by doing that, you got rid of more secure, steady lines that produced more predictable um, revenue for the company. What do you think in retrospect? The benefit of looking in retrospect is that you can see how things evolve. Uh, at the time, I thought that was the right thing. Looking back, it was the right thing. We were able to divest the Upzone business and create a generic uh, super house. Uh, this business had a very big exposure in China and uh, we didn't want to have that anymore. And uh, uh, data showed us that uh, we were right. Uh, the business suffered a lot after we divested it in China. Uh, the second part that we divested was our consumer business. And uh, over there, we created the largest the consumer healthcare a business in the world that is traded right now very successfully in the stock market and we have a 30% share into that business. So uh, it was both of them moves. It was uh, looking back very well done. So I talked about Lilly and that stock has gone to the moon. And as we said, your stock has lagged. Is it a situation now you think where investors should maybe sell Lilly stock? and buy Pfizer stock because one is overvalued and one is undervalued? I will not speak about uh, Lilies and what investors should do to their stock, but uh, I would say that they should buy Pfizer stock. When it comes to stock, it's never a sprint, it's a marathon. And maybe we had, let's say, a dip right now, but as Warren Buffett said, buy low and sell high. Right now, the Pfizer stock has a yield of uh, dividend, but it is almost like uh, the best bond in the world, almost uh, 6% in this current the prices of, of the stock. So uh, with uh, that low price and that high yield, I think uh, it is very good investment for Pfizer. I bought a lot of Pfizer stock. When did you buy Pfizer stock? I, last time that I did was in December. How much? All my pension. Is that right? Well, how much is that? I don't want to give you the number, okay. but uh, all my pension, I put it into Pfizer stock. I'm connected. The chips there. I'm, I'm all in. Okay, fair enough. So is, is Pfizer, do you consider Pfizer still to be at the very top echelon when it comes to pharma names? I mean, the name has gotten a little bit tarnished over the past year or so, but does it still belong in the same pantheon? The, the name became a little bit tarnished only with investors and because the financial performance of the stock was not good. Uh, right now, Pfizer enjoys the highest reputation of all pharmaceutical companies in the world. We have the highest uh, recognizability 
of the brand, and I'm not talking only in the US, I'm talking in every single country in the world, and very high favorability. Very few companies were able, and non-pharma, to achieve this level of favorability. So I think we are in our very high. Let me ask you about R&D. Um, you spent, what, $11.4 billion in 2022. Is that too much? Has it really panned out for you? You know, the R&D investment needs to be um, tailor-made to what you are trying to achieve. Our revenue base that we're projecting in the beginning of the year was around $70 billion for 2023. And that was the right number of R&D investment. COVID uh, proven to be less uh, in terms of uh, how much could contribute to the top line of Pfizer. So the 70 became 60. We adjusted our cost base accordingly. So still right now, Pfizer will have uh, one of the highest R&D budgets in, in the industry, including Cedric. Um The decision to offload the immunology drug known as RVT-3101, RVT I want to ask you about that, the technical kind of thing, the name at least. What went wrong there? I, I'm so, are you referring to the TL1A? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't think anything went wrong. Uh, we had to prioritize our portfolio and we divested not the whole molecule, but we kept 50% of the financial uh, MPV of the molecule and we gave the remaining uh, to another company so that they can invest. So all the money that uh, goes into this investment uh, goes uh, is paid by them. Now, that was uh, bought by Roche. Right. And, and, but did uh, you leave money on the table then because of that, the Roche acquisition? Uh, that will remain, uh, remain to be seen. But uh, right now, you need to know that we have uh, uh, rights. Uh, we have royalties in the US. We don't have to pay uh, for the development. We received uh, $1.7 billion in cash. And we have outside the US and Japan, the entire world is ours. Right. Um, what about guidance to the street? There was a lot of talk. I think uh, your CFO, Dave Denton, talked about 6% CAGR, and maybe that seems aggressive and too ambitious these days. What is Wall Street telling you uh, about top line growth and what do they need to see and how are you communicating that? I don't think that people are speaking about the same things many times. Uh, David spoke about the growth between uh, now and 25. And uh, given where 23 ended, it's very difficult to achieve 6% without COVID and without externally business development. We will achieve 6%, including business development. And David made it that clear. Now, what about the street expectations? The street expectations are less than what we have. And uh, we think that uh, we are right. And I think the only way that uh, we can prove that it is by delivering. So it is quarter after quarter delivering on top and bottom line. And this is where the numbers will end up being. Albert, let me ask you about COVID. Um, you know, you guys helped save the world, arguably, with your vaccine and with Paxlovid. Those businesses are less than they were. How do you see the vaccine, excuse me, the, the, the COVID um, playing out over the years? And what is your role? How will those drugs do? Clear, we are very proud of what we were able to achieve. And uh, uh, I think uh, the world will never forget. Um, now, going forward, COVID, I think, will be less than what we thought. And uh, we are have gave projections of $8 billion for year 2024. I think it is very reliable, very basic projections. I think there could be an upside, but these are our projections right now. $8 billion is a lot of money. So it's part of, uh, of our business. Two of these products, five billions one and then three billions the other, are setting those both into blockbuster status and into among the top products of ICE. So that will continue. But we have turned the page. Mm -hmm. It's not anymore a fuss about saving the world with COVID. That is in the back page. Mm -hmm. Right now for us, it is making it once more. And our best bet to do it once more is with cancer. And one of the best levers we have with cancer to do it, it is the acquisition of CJ. Right. And, and just to follow up though about COVID, do you anticipate people getting a vaccine every year? It seems like, what was it? It was so much less this year than obviously in previous years. What does do, that look like to you? I do anticipate that people will be getting, but will be less than what they used to be. Any the, sort of the percentage of, of what that 
Would I be... think this year in the U.S. around seventeen. The U.S. was a small percentage, around seventeen percent. Yeah, eighteen, of seventeen. People, that's right. Mm-hmm. Eighteen, seventeen percent. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think that uh, that's a basic figure that I think people will continue doing that. If we bring combination products with the flu, I think that will uplift uh, the percentage of people that they are choosing to make a COVID vaccine because the convenience uh, will bring it closer to the flu vaccinations. Flu vaccinations are around 50% in the world. Now, outside the US, in other parts of the world, particularly Northern Europe, are way, way higher, those numbers. And uh, and, uh, those, I think, again, will continue. The problem is that um, as the COVID mutates and as people that they had some protection from the initial vaccine, they don't have it anymore because the original vaccinations, they don't protect well against the new strains. Uh, I think the clinical manifestation of the disease uh, will, will be coming with more severe symptoms, which is what we see right now. This is why a lot of people are going to use Paxlovid right now. Right, right. Let me ask you, shifting gears a little bit about uh, the regulatory outlook and how your relationship is with Washington when it comes to drug pricing. What is the latest there and what is your relationship like with the Biden administration and what do you anticipate going forward? As with all administrations, we try to have very, very good relations. With the Biden administration, we had very, very good uh, relations because we were able to work together during the COVID and that created bonds uh, that um, I think uh, they were extremely important. This doesn't mean that we agree with everything that they do as they don't agree with everything that we say. Um, so right now, uh, I think that uh, the big opportunity for Americans to see reduced drug pricing is to have a reform into the rebate system. And uh, right now, there are bills which are bipartisan bills, both in Senate and in the House. And I think we've never been closer uh, before to an opportunity to see a solution that will materially lower the cost of Americans for drugs. Well, you sound sanguine about those bills, both in terms of the possibility of them passing and you actually supporting them. Is there one that in particular that you think is particularly meaningful in terms of your there business? There is none that it is how I would like them to happen, but all of them are very positive because they are pushing things to the right direction. And all of them are bipartisan and they are all of them, they are both in house and in the Senate. So I would support them. Right. And final question, Albert, there is a lot of talk about artificial intelligence these days. So I feel it's incumbent upon me to ask you about Pfizer and AI. Is Pfizer using AI in any way? How would that change your business and in fact, the entire industry? We are, we do use AI for years. And of course, uh, every year we have more powerful AI tools. And Paxlovid, which is the oral drug for uh, against COVID was designed with uh, computational modeling with uh, with the use of AI, artificial intelligence. So, and that's why we're able to do what normally takes four years into four months the design of the molecule before we start putting into into the clinic. Um, right now, with uh, we have a revolution this year with the uh, land, large language models and the generative AI, and we plan to be in the forefront of utilizing those tools so that we can bring more and better patients faster, more and better medicines to patients faster. Right. Albert Borla, CEO of Pfizer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Andy, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. This is Ed Behrens. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.